Dear friends and family in Christ, may the love, joy, hope, and promise of Christmas dwell within your heart this day and each and every day. Amen. Please bow your heads with me as we go to our Lord in prayer. We thank you, O Heavenly Father, for blessing us with the gift of your Son, Christ Jesus, who is the Word, the Word made flesh, the light who enlightens our hearts this day and every day. We pray, O Lord, that each day that we would trust in you, that we would know in your great foolishness that you have chosen us to be your children. Help us to rejoice in this promise. Help us to live out this promise. Help us to know your love. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. In an unnamed, small, Midwestern town, there was a town that had what we would call a town fool. And in this small town, which will still remain unnamed, the people liked to tease the town fool. He liked, they liked to give him a hard time. In fact, they invented a game so that they could to their amusement. In one hand, a person would hold a penny. In the other, they would hold a quarter. And then they would ask which one the town fool wanted. The town fool would, time after time, to the amusement and the laughter of the townspeople, choose the penny. Well, there was a man who was traveling, and he came from out of town. And he asked this town fool, as he was known, why do you always choose the penny? Don't you know that the quarter is of the greater value? The town fool, as he was called, looked at this other man, and he said to him, if I chose the quarter, they would stop playing the game. Besides the fact that this small town needs a little bit more to do with their time and energy, there is a point to this illustration. In fact, it's maybe a point that as well needs to be received. And that is the fact that things are not always as they appear. That is the fact that sometimes when people do what is unexpected, then they are labeled as a fool. They are labeled as one who, maybe even worse, doesn't know what they're doing. But that's not always the case, is it? Let me give you a few examples. Think about a doctor who tries a new procedure for the first time. If she is successful with that procedure, she's known as a revolutionary. But what happens if that procedure fails, if she didn't stick with what she always did? She's known as the quack, the one who has the malpractice suit against her. Or how about the scientist, who's willing to challenge the laws of physics just a little bit, maybe to bend them, maybe not to break them, but at least to bend them. If he's successful with his experiment, he's known as a pioneer. A new law will be named after him. If he's unsuccess, unsuccessful, if I could speak, he's known as ignorant, foolish. How about a military general who tries a new strategy? He brings the troops in from another direction. If he's successful, he's considered a hero. That it's new strategies named after him. If not, well, he maybe is demoted and forgotten. And so many things in life are like this. We like to stick to the status quo. We like to stick with what is comfortable, with what is easy, with what is normal. We like to stick with what seems to fit in with everyone else. But that's not exactly what God's Word tells us to do, is it? That's not exactly what we're encouraged to do. In fact, God's Word oftentimes is contrary to what the world tells us to do. The wisdom that is found in God's Word, well, it shapes and it forms us. At times, it's hard to live out in a world that has its own set of playing rules, its own set of wisdom. Listen again to Paul's words to the church in Ephesus. This is Ephesians chapter 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. In Him we have redemption. Through His blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished upon us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. Now I know there's a lot right there, so let's break that down a little bit. First of all, the wisdom that we're given is that we are saved not by our own works, not by ourselves, but by Christ alone, by the precious gift of Christ's blood. Paul points us right away to the redemption, 
we have in the blood of Christ. And that is the first place that contradicts our world. So often in the world we live in today, we're told that if we wish to succeed, we need to do it ourselves. And there's something to be said, don't get me wrong, about using the gifts and abilities God has given you. Taking initiative when God has laid out a place for you to go. But also realizing that we have a dependence on God. We have a need for God. We have a need for His forgiveness. Because there are a lot of things we can do in this world. There are a lot of things we can do in this life. You can become professional singers. Or pro you can become a great scientist or great doc doctor. But to save ourselves, we only can depend on Christ. And that flies in the face of the world. Because in the face of the world, it's all about what I can do. It's all about pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps. Isn't that our American identity? The identity that we have that if we, can do, if we can't do it, then it can't be done. We are autonomous. We are individuals. But look through God's Word, through the pages of God's Word. Not only does it show us a dependence on God, but there's a further dependence. A dependence on one another. A need for one another. We are created to be in fellowship with one another. To love and care for one another. To mourn with one another. To celebrate with one another. Time and again in God's Word, even Jesus was in community. Even on the night of His betrayal, on His crucifixion, He went to the garden alone, but not completely alone, did He? He had three disciples, Peter, James, and John with Him. Even as he went to the cross, he was not alone. Only when he died was he truly alone. And time and again, God's word encourages us, contrary to the world, that we need others. That it is not a sign of weakness to ask for help, to seek strength from others, to seek prayer from others, but to seek. But ra rather, God's word tells us that it is strength that we have as believers coming together. And not only that, but Paul envisions this community of people of God as those who are united. Now I know this is sometimes hard for us to understand, but Paul puts it very clearly what he means here. And just a f couple of chapters later, Ephesians 4, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ, God, forgave you. That's another place where we struggle, isn't it, in the world today? Forgiveness. Where do we see true unity? It is in forgiveness. But is that the message of the world? Is that the wisdom that we have from the world? No. Rather, the world encourages us to seek revenge. To get back at someone who has harmed us so that they can at least experience the same pain that we're experiencing. We need to make sure that they do. But God's Word says otherwise. God's Word says to put aside the bitterness and the anger, to put aside the pain. And to forgive. To forgive. How hard is that for us to do? How hard is, uh, is it for us to let go? It might be one thing to say the words, I forgive you. But how often is it true for us that when we forgive someone, back in the back of our mind, sitting there, the next time they do something, we remember it and we are happy to haul it out and throw it in their face and remind them of... And it's so hard for us to do as the Lord does. To forgive and to forget. But that is what brings about unity. Unity among the people of God. To put aside the differences we have. To forgive when someone has harmed us. And even to forgive those who don't seem to deserve our forgiveness. Now that's hard, isn't it? It might be easy to forgive someone who maybe they've done one thing to us or a small thing, but what about when it's something that we just, it binds in our heart. When we wake up in the morning, we think about it. Before we go to sleep at night, if we're able to fall asleep, we think about it and wrestle with it. Those things, to find unity, we have to put aside and turn them over to our Lord. Turn them over to the Lord, who even though it seems foolish, forgave us who sent His Son Jesus in the form of a child into this world 
it's just a little baby. It seems foolish. It doesn't seem like a king should come that way, does it, in the manger? Yet he sent his son, king of creation, into the world to rule creation, but not the way a king would rule. How foolish of him to rule with humility, to grow up to, with wisdom and stature, to be a 12-year-old boy who is in the temple learning and teaching, to grow up to be a man who gives his life on the cross. Perhaps the devil thought his success had been come to completion. How foolish it would be to allow your only son to die. And yet that's what God did. Sent his son to die for us, for you and for me. Sent his son to give his life for you and for me, for us on the cross. That he shed his blood so that we might have forgiveness of each and every one of our sins. When we still did not even realize how much we needed it. How much we deserved condemnation and death. He sent his son Jesus to forgive us. To give us the promise of eternal life. It's almost as if God chose a bunch of pennies. Hundreds and thousands and millions of pennies. Except they weren't shiny pennies. They were tarnished and they were bent and they had been through. The heads were worn off some of them. Like God went and he chose those pennies as foolish as it seemed. He didn't want the shiny quarters. He wanted us pennies. And so he came into the world to redeem us. And by his blood he did. By his blood he washed us and made us clean. He shined us and he gave us a name. He gave us the name children of God. His sons and daughters. And Paul gives us one more reminder of what true wisdom is. And that is knowing the hope and promise of our salvation. Knowing that it cannot be one in us, but that there is a promise that is greater than this world that we live in. That there's a promised hope that means that one day we will be rescued from this life, from the pain and suffering of this world, from the tears and hurt of this world, from the brokenness of this world. And one day we will be with Him. One day we'll be with Him where the sun will not burn us by day, where there will no more, be no more pain and suffering, only joy in His presence. Solomon says in the first chapter and again in the ninth chapter of Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now unfortunately, the Hebrew doesn't distinguish between the fear of shaking in your boots, your knees wobbling, and the fear of awe. But if you read the context there, Paul, excuse me, Solomon is referring to that hope and promise that we have when we stand in the fear of God, in the awe of God and His wonder, in the wonder of His majesty that He came into this world, that He redeemed us of our sins, and that He has a kingdom that He prepares a place for us even now. And that truly is the hope of Christmas. That is the true beginning of wisdom, knowing that God loves us, that God loves you and has redeemed you, that God is preparing a place for you. May the hope and promise of our Lord and Savior Jesus live within your hearts this day and each day. Amen. Please bow your heads with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do give thanks to you for your Son, Christ Jesus. And we pray for your forgiveness for those times when we don't see your plan at work in our lives and in the world. We pray for your forgiveness for those times when we instead of seeing your wisdom of your word the wisdom of your love and mercy, and we seek the wisdom of this life. Help us instead to always know the true wisdom that comes in the forgiveness of our sins, the grace and mercy, the hope that we have that one day we shall be with you. Help us each day to live lives that are, that are contrary to this world, lives that instead of seeking the wisdom of the world, reflect your love and your grace. Use us, O oh Lord, to speak the words of good news. Use us, use our hands to, to share the good news by our actions. Use us, so gracious Lord, to be those who bring your love to the world around us, that all may know your promised salvation and may know the wisdom of being your children, the promise that one day we shall rest with you. In all things we praise and thank you, serve and obey, and in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.